Good morning, Ignite Church. How are you guys doing today? Come on, give the Lord a mighty, mighty hand clap praise. We're so glad that you made it out to the house of God. We actually kick off a new series today. And if you're watching online, we're so glad that you're joining us as well. We're kicking off this series. Um, we've actually never spoken here at Ignite uh, about finances. For the past five years that we've been here, we haven't really touched a series. We've done series about everything. I mean, almost everything. We've had funny series. We've had serious series. We have a lot. But today we're going to be launching a series called, say it with me, Keep the Change. Say it loud. Keep the Change. And I put as a slogan here, which is actually the title of this message is, In God We Trust. You know, it's actually in our dollar bills and our money here in the U.S., we have the words, in God we trust, inscribed on the dollar bills or on our money here in the U.S. I did a little bit of digging up to see where did this come from. And believe it or not, it actually came from the Bible. There's whoever wrote, I forgot the person's name, um, who brought this into the, in the not early, late 1800s, something like that. He found it in Psalms chapter 56. And I was so intrigued by it that, you know, many things that we have today in this country that the enemy is trying to rob from us were all in the Bible. That's why it's super important that we don't lose sight of who we follow and for why God has called us to do things as believers here on this earth. And today we're going to explore what the Bible says about money and how we honor God with our finances. See, the main theme is not that generosity is a demand of God, but instead an invitation from God. Tell your neighbor an invitation. Generation, uh, ge sorry, generosity is not a demand. If you notice, the Bible never says God demands you to do something. God doesn't say, there's no scripture in the commandments. There's nothing that says that you have to give to the Lord. Instead, it actually says, try me now. It's like an invitation from God. Whenever you see something that talks about giving in the Bible, it's God inviting us. When you invite someone, why are you inviting them? Because you have something to give them, right? You invite someone to a party because you want them to come and celebrate. When you invite someone to a wedding, you want them to feel happy that you are celebrating and they get to enjoy of that celebration. The same thing here. Generosity is not a demand of God. Instead, it's an invitation of God. And we're going to embark on this journey together and discover the freedom to be able to say, keep the change. Tell your neighbor, keep the change. Doesn't it feel good, like I said earlier, to tell someone, keep the change? You go to that Starbucks, you know, that $50 Starbucks, because nowadays it's over with inflation, you're like spending $50 in Starbucks. Keep the change. And I'm not talking about the 50 cents. I'm not talking about 25 cents. I'm talking about being really generous and saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to give you a tip. You know, I'm not going to give you that. You, before Carlos, it was the 15%. Remember when it was 15% tipping? Anybody here remember that? Then it went to 18%, right? I, I don't remember the 10 because probably I was too young, right? But 10, it, was, it used to be 10, then it was 15, then 18, and now it's 20 on average, right? Or 22. And it's funny that whenever you go somewhere, now they demand the tip, right? Have you noticed that? They demand the tip. You go buy something. It's even takeout. It could be like you're standing in a line in the mall and you're just, I want number one. And you're there like when you're going to go pay tip, right? The world demands many things. Interestingly, God doesn't. He invites you into generosity. Right now, you might feel like your finances probably would never turn around. I know finances is a, it's a big, big, touchy subject. Why? Because it's something that we all need. 
You can't live here on the face of the earth without money. Money is not everything, but money is needed for everything. Can I get an amen? Right? So, and it might feel that you always are living in the same patterns. How many of you identified? You're living in the same patterns. And, but I want today to, let's put that aside for a minute. Let's lay the foundation as we spark this conversation with some basic, thoughtful questions. One of them that I want to ask you today is, that how did you get here? How did you get here financially? Where you are today, how did you get there? What does the Bible say about finances? See, the Bible talks actually a lot about finances, believe it or not. What have we misinterpreted about money and God? So a lot of people say, oh, oh money is evil. No, 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 no. Jesus never said that money is evil. He said that the root of all evil is the love of money. He never said money was evil. But the love of money, yes, that is the root of all evil. Interestingly, it's the root of all evil. What does, the, what does God ask of me? So I'm going to share with you a couple points here. One of them is the deceptive pursuit of wealth. How many of you know that we live in a world that all the world promotes is wealth, wealth? Well, how can you become rich in 10 days? How can you become a millionaire by following these five steps? This, 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 and it's like so bombarding. You're like, you go on Instagram, you go on TikTok, you go on all social medias, and it's like becoming rich. Oh, I, I did this TikTok, then I became viral, and I became a millionaire overnight. I was watching this kid, actually, the other day. I found this so interesting. He became a billionaire, a millionaire, sorry, a millionaire. He was only 19 years old, and now he sells his tricks on how you become a millionaire 19 years old. Back then when I was growing up, millionaires were people that worked hard, you know, they, they put their effort, they put in an enterprise and stuff like that. Nowadays, you just put a funny video and you start doing funny videos, you follow, get followers and you become a millionaire. It's like money has no value many times. And I'm not talking bad about that. I'm not saying that if you're a TikTok influencer, it's bad. But money nowadays really does not have value. I try to tell my kids all the time, you got to be careful with your money. You got to value what you have because someone worked very hard for that. It's not like, oh, money comes down from the trees. Oh, let's go to a restaurant. I love my children always tell me, oh, dad, I don't want to eat at home today. Can we go to the restaurant? Say what? Back then you could go to McDonald's and spend $15 in a family of four, eight. Now it becomes 30 or $40. And that's not, they don't even have a dollar menu anymore. Can I get a witness? It's the truth. Life is changing. But you know what? We don't have to live with a burden or a bondage that is called financial stress. Listen to what Jesus said in the Bible when he's talking about the pursuit of wealth. It's in Luke chapter 12, verse 15. And he says, then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. I love the next part. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Let me repeat that one more time. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. If I pause there for a minute, this goes totally against the culture that we live in. Why? Because our culture tells you the more you have, the better off you are. The more you store, the better off you are, right? The social status that you have, the higher, the better off you are. But Jesus says life does not consist of the possessions of this life. Listen to this. Then he goes on to say this parable in verse 16. The ground of a certain rich man yields an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, well, what should I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, well, this is what I will do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Hey, take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20 is interesting. He says, but God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be 
with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is poor, or sorry, but is not rich towards God. Jesus talks about how the world is obsessed with wealth and possessions. And Jesus reminds us that the true life's essence is not found in material things. Now, don't, mind, don't get me wrong. Having material things is good, right? How many can say amen? But life does not consist of material things. See, life cannot, uh, money cannot give you health. It will pay for your medical bills, but the doctor can't give you health if there is no health given from God. Money cannot buy you certain things because if money could buy you everything in life, then everyone who has money will be happy. Everyone who has money will live longer. Cancer will probably not exist for certain people that have money. Certain things that we know that happen to people's lives will not happen. But that's not the case. Why? Because life does not consist in the possessions that one has. And Jesus warns us, this, this parable kind of outlines the life of an American, right? The American dream. Let's be bigger, stronger, you know, grow more. And if you notice something, Jesus said this parable is not that he's condemning the fact of growing and, and, and becoming wealthier. The issue is when you become rich towards yourself, but poor towards God. Rich towards yourself, meaning you, it's all about you, but poor towards God. See, a lot of people want to be rich, and there's nothing wrong with being rich. I want to make that clear. But when God is out of your equation, then it's totally wrong. That's what Jesus is just basically putting it all in a nutshell. Why? Because when you're seeking your growth, when you're seeking your wealth, some of the things that you say is like, oh, I don't have time for God because I have to work. Have you ever heard that? Oh, I can't go to church on Sunday because, you know, I, I, I need to work. I got, I got to make money. God understands that I got to sustain myself. Oh, I don't have time to serve because I have X, Y, Z project that I'm working on. Oh, I, I, I don't give to the kingdom because I'm on a savings plan. I've heard that before. Pastor Eric, I don't give my tithes because I'm on a savings plan. Okay. You continue saving and getting a 1% return on your investment. Well, how about trusting God? That's why he says, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you prepared for yourself? This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. You see, when you're blessed, you need to remind yourself that all you have is not your own doing, but God gave you the ability to do. All that you have is not your own doing. It's like, I gained this by my own strength. Yes, you did. You had strength. But the one who gave you that strength was God Almighty. The one who gave you the wisdom was God Almighty. I look at all these rich people, all of these famous people, all of these entrepreneurs, and I look up to them because they are smart people. But let me tell you something. That wisdom came from heaven above. It's not like they just, or, or, you know, they, they gained it themselves. No, they, they did work hard. I'm not taking that. I'm not taking away credit from what they did. But God is the giver. The Bible says that all good gifts comes from the Father above. That's why it's super important to remember that our joy should be in the giver and not in his gifts. It's easy to get tangled in the gifts that we forget about the giver. You don't even have to have a lot to do that. You, you don't believe me? What is the first thing that comes to mind when God blesses you? Or blesses you financially. Some of the things that you say is like, what am I going to buy? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? It's the I, I, I. It's never about how can I bless someone? What does God's kingdom need that I can be part of? Lord, what purpose or plan do you have with this blessing for my life? 
I always say, God doesn't bless you for you just to sit back and say, mm, this is so good. Mm, 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 mm. There's nothing wrong with that. Because sometimes God blesses you like that. And you're like, mm, 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 oh, yeah, yeah. But in that, mm, mm, yeah, yeah, you should be thinking, well, now that I've enjoyed it, how can I bless someone? How can it be in a, a branch of, a, of blessing? How can I be connected to Christ so I can reach somebody else for Christ? Because guess what? This world is just a passing world. This is not eternal. That's why Jesus says, store your treasure in heaven where it will not rust, where it will not decay. Not here on earth where it will rust and decay. I don't know if you guys are following me. This nature of I, I starts when we're small. We live in a world of our own satisfaction. Sadly, gratitude is not natural to many of us. Think about Adam and Eve. They had everything. Adam and Eve had everything. What do you mean they had everything? They had eternal life. They had a garden with everything. See, the Bible only speaks a little portion of the garden, but one thing it does say is that it had everything. Anything that Adam and Eve needed, they had it there. They didn't have to work for it. They were never going to work for it. Thank you, Adam and Eve. They were never going to have to put hard work in. The Bible says that everything they needed to eat, anything they needed, everything was there. But they wanted more. They wanted to be selfish. So they listened to the lie of the enemy. Did God really say this? Sounds, sounds kind of similar to when we're talking about finances in church. Did God really say that you should honor him with your money? I mean, I think God wants you to first fix yourself before you honor him. It's like the lies. The enemy doesn't change. His tactics <laughs> don't, don't change. He might look different because he disguises himself in different ways. He disguised himself as a serpent back then, but he disguised himself today as many things. But his lies are still the same. You don't believe me? Think about the times that you've been tempted and that you've fallen. They're probably the same exact thing that you always fail at. But it comes in different disguises. The liar, the deceiver. I was, that was not part of my notes, but probably that's for someone here today. If it's only when we lack or we're in trouble that we come back to God like the prodigal son asking for more and asking for his forgiveness listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 8 verse 12 when Jesus spoke again to the people he said I am the light of the world whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life you will never walk in darkness now, when we read that, sometimes we think that it's only walking in darkness in our eternity. No, it's talking about how you walk every day. It's about having clarity of what next steps you need to take. It's about having wisdom about when you're in a situation, a circumstance, because guess what? You're going to have obstacles in life. Only because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you're free from obstacles. No, 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 no. You're going to have obstacles and you might even have more obstacles. But the difference is that when you are in Christ, Christ has your back. When you put God's word to practice, the word becomes alive and power in your life. Church, as we navigate the complexities of this financial journey, let's allow his light to guide our decisions. Listen, point number two, which I'm going to hit a little bit more next week. It's breaking free from financial bondage. Financial bondage. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7, it says, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. Now, this verse warns us a lot about the danger of debt. And I, I could probably, I'm not going to ask, but I could probably I'm 100% sure that if I ask you guys to raise up your hand, mostly all of you will raise your hand and say, yes, I have debt. We live in a world that makes debt easy. And that's why the world is where it is today. Do you remember the 2018 bubble? 28, sorry, 2008 bubble, was it? 
2008 bubble. You remember when everybody was buying houses that didn't have money to, 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 to pay for a house. So you have like four properties. I had coworkers that had four properties and yet they made $15 the hour. I don't know how they got the bank approved that, but it happened. And what happens is this bubble just started growing, growing, growing. And it popped. And then the properties that were worth $500,000 were now worth $100,000. Because we inflated the balloon so much. It's kind of happening right now, right? It's kind of a little scary what's happening with the housing market today. But what happens is it's easy to become a slave to debt. It's easy to apply for a credit card. Hey, apply today, 30 seconds or less. You'll find out if you're approved and they'll send you the automatic credit card. Right? When you go to the store today, what do they tell you? Oh, if you sign up today, you get 15% off your first purchase. You're basically telling me I'm getting my taxes and a little bit more off. 15% off, right? But we fall into the lie of the enemy. And so what happens is we become a slave to the debt. I came to tell you today that there is a way out of your bondage. There is a way out in Jesus' name. Let's talk about the heavy questions. See, debt can become a heavy burden, hindering our ability to live freely and generously. And it's time that we break free from financial bondage. I know that all of us have made mistakes in our past with our finances. I raise my hand. I've made a lot of financial mistakes that I'm learning from. But let, let's really set our mind today on how we can break free from those bondages. You see, burdens will always be present, but bondage should not. Bondage should not. You shouldn't be bound to no one, but only serve Jesus Christ. Because what happens is when you are bound to debt, who are you serving? Debt. Why do you go to work today, tomorrow? To pay your debt. You don't go to work because, hey, I'm going to go to work and have fun. No. Sometimes you don't even want to go to work. You don't even want to see your co-worker's face. I don't. I'm kidding. I work in my house. I have no face to look at. <laughs> I work remote. But think about it. You go to work because you have a need. You have a debt to pay. Wouldn't it be nice to say, you know what? I'm my own boss today. I'm my own boss. I got no bills to pay. I'm free from debt. My house is paid for. I got no credit card debt. My cars are paid. I work because I just want to work and not be bored at home. You're like, Pastor Eric, that's not me. I don't want to work at all. Good for you. Stay home. But there's some people that do. They want to work just to have fun, to just enjoy life. And guess what? You could do that. You could do that when you're not a slave to debt. Let's talk a little bit about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, it says, Do not be misled. It says, Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. Here the apostle Paul is, is talking to the church of Corinth and he says, hey, hey, be careful you don't be misled by bad company. And what does this have to do with your finances? You might think, well, you know what? Who you hang around with will really determine sometimes how you act financially. You might be around someone that is constantly getting in debt and buying, oh, I want that Louis Vuitton purse. I want to get those Gucci shoes. I want this and this and that. And you, those are the people you surround yourself with and you don't have the money and you just want to impress them. You start buying and buying and buying and buying and buying. Can I get a witness? Why? Because we live in a consuming world, consumer world. And if we're not very careful, we get hung up with that. If you, hung, if you hang out with slugs, you end up becoming one. Cheapos love company. People that are cheap love company too. Who are you hanging around with? Credit cards are a man's best friend. <laughs> Stop wasting tomorrow's wealth today. If your circle is more Taking than giving, be careful. If your circle is more taking than giving, 
Ojo. Be very careful. Because you end up becoming like them. That's why it says be careful. Because bad company corrupts good character. You need to cultivate a mindset of being a good steward. Our money is not our own church. Our money is God's. If we embrace stewardship, we need to learn to manage the resources that he has given us with wisdom, but also generosity. Tell your neighbor generosity. Embracing God's invitation to generosity. I want, I want to focus now on that part. Embracing God's invitation to generosity. Generosity is not a demand from God, but instead an invitation. An invitation. As we honor God with our finances, we experience the joy to participate in his work, in his kingdom, and his blessing. Jesus put it in these simple words in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. It's going to come on your screens. It says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, your heart will be there also. Have you ever said something to the terms of, I wish I could do more? Anyone here? I, I, I wish I could help. I, I, I would love to dot, dot, dot. And, and, and the question is, why aren't you? You see, sometimes we think that, oh, I don't have enough. Uh, I, 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 I may never achieve it. It's just beyond me. And the truth of the matter is that generosity holds the power to unlock the doors of abundance you yearn for. Generosity is the key to unlocking the doors of abundance that you ask for. Without it, the doors remain shut. See, many of us want to do more. Many of us want to give more. But if we don't take the first little steps of giving, you can never expect to give more. That's why the Bible says that he who is faithful in the little shall avail in much. You have to be faithful with what you have today. Generosity leaves an everlasting mark. Second Corinthians verse Chapter 9, verse 7, it says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We always use this verse when we come and talk about offering, right? You've heard it before in churches. Señor bendice el dador alegre. ¿Cuánto están alegre? And some of you are like, mm, Tengo que darle señor mi ofrenda. Gloria a Dios. I remember I went once to a big church, actually, one of the biggest churches here in the U.S., and uh, I'm not going to say names. And when the time of offering came, that the pastor stood up there and said, well, we're going to give God our offering. The whole congregation, thousands and thousands of people, started clapping. Woo! I looked around. I'm like, what's wrong with these people? Because I, I, I didn't know that people would get that excited. But I learned that day that joy should be the first thing that we have before we give. It should be a joy to give to God. God, I got a million problems, but I'm trusting in you. I'm believing in you. There's a there's a scripture that I, I, I wasn't going to share today in, in my message, but I wrote it here just in case I felt the Lord guide me to it. I'm not, it's not going to come out on your screens, but if you want to write it down, you, you could definitely read it at home. It's a famous story in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1-7, through 7, and it's the life of a widow. I've been talking about widows today because they're a perfect example of seeing God's provision. See, a widow doesn't have someone else that could provide for them. A widow many times has to work super hard, extra hard. My mom's a widow. We have widows here in the church. The Bible talks that the real religion, if you want to talk about religion, right? The only time the Bible talks about religion are those who take care of widows and children in distress. 
That's why it's super important why we go to Dominican Republic and we do missions with kids in orphanages and we try to help out wherever we can. Because that's what Christ has called it to do, right? Aside from the Great Commission, we just preach the gospel to all, everyone. But there's this widow in the Bible that she comes to the prophet, the man of God, and she says, my, my husband was one who served among you, was a god free man, but he left us this debt. See, you could be a god free person, but still have debt. You could make mistakes. Surely that was the case. And it says, and now my debtors are coming for my children. See, back then they didn't uh, put a, a notice, on, an eviction notice on your door. No, they came for your family. Your children are now my slaves. They got to work out the debt. Only because now somebody dies here in the U.S., the debt is clean. You know, it goes through court, all that stuff many times. Back then, you had a debt. Your family had to pay the debt. Which is why Jesus died on the cross for you. And so there was this debt. I don't know how big the debt was. But if they were coming after her children, I assume it was big. She had two kids, two boys. And the prophet says, what do you have? See, God is always going to tell you, what do you have? God is never going to say, oh, don't worry, don't worry, I got this. Even though he can. But if he does that, then he ruins you. He spoils you. What is God always going to call you into? Action in faith. Faith and action. And so the prophet says, what do you have? And the, the, prophet, the, the widow's like, she's probably doing an inventory in her head. She's like, uh, clearly I have nothing. That's why I'm coming to you. But as she's doing an inventory in her head, she says, I have nothing but just a little bit of oil. I have nothing but just a little bit of oil. I sometimes read this verse. I've read this verse a million times. I've preached on this verse a million times. And I just think to myself, why would she mention the oil? Why would she mention just a little bit of oil? If we take it to the spiritual sense, oil represents anointing. Just a little bit of oil. See, that's why I say it's never too late to be free from whatever you are facing in life. You cannot say, well, because it happened to my grandparents and it happened to my parents, it's going to happen to me, it's going to happen to my children. No, you have the authority to cut the curse in the name of Jesus. You have the authority to break the patterns in the name of Jesus. Only because the people that were before you were poor and struggled and were captives and, and I'm, I'm sorry, slaves to death does not mean you have to be a slave to death. You could break that curse in the name of Jesus. And so the, the prophet says, uh, what do you have? And she's like, I have just a little bit of oil. And he said, okay, go into your house. Ask your neighbors for lots of vessels. That's why it's, you have to be ready. You got to be wet, ready and willing for God to use you. When he gives you a word, he gives you the word because he knows the power that the word has. That's why he says, I never say something that will return to me void. I always release it with a purpose. Some of you have forgotten the purpose that God has released the words into your life. And he's telling you, remember. Because I never say something that returns to me void. And so the prophet tells her, Ask your neighbors for all the empty vessels, as much empty vessels you can get. So I imagine them knocking on the house and saying, hey, do you have an empty vessel? Yeah, here's a jar. Here's another jar. Here's another jar. Here's another jar. So they bring all those jars. And he says, and when you get all the empty vessels, close the door. Church, you want to see financial prosperity? Don't let your left, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. The biggest givers in life never put their name to their gift. Sometimes we want people to know, oh, but look at me, look at me, look at me. Forget about you. Think about the person you're blessing. Think about the person God has called you to bless. That's why generosity is not a demand, it's an invitation because God wants to show you what he can do through you. With whatever you have, even if it's a little bit of oil. And so this woman brings it in, and the Bible says that she closes the door, and she tells her children, okay, pass me a vessel. 
the little bit of oil she starts pouring. And I imagine her eyes, she sees that little bit of oil just start pouring and pouring and pouring. Give me another vessel. And that oil keeps on going, going, going. And they fill like a hundred vessels. And when she asks her son for the hundred and one vessel, I don't know how many vessels, but I'm just saying a hundred and one vessel. He's like, mom, we don't have no more vessels. And the moment that they had no more vessels, the oil stopped. She goes to the prophet. She tells the prophet what happened. The prophet knew what was going to happen. But she tells the prophet, and he says, go pay your debt and live free from the rest. God doesn't want you or I to live in debt. But what happened with that prophet is what God is asking us today. Would you trust me with the little bit of oil you have? God didn't say... Go get the tanks of oil that you got stored in the storage. It's like, what do you have? All I have is a little bit of oil. Would you please stand to your feet with me today? Church, as we navigate this financial journey, we need to remind ourselves that life's true essence is not found in the possessions that we have, but in who we shall serve, in Him. Life's possessions should not be in what we have, but in Him. Together, we can break from financial bondage. We can live with a mindset of a steward, and we could joyfully respond to God's invitation to generosity. But guess what? It starts with a little bit of oil. Starts with you. Mind you, I have not even started talking about tithing or offering. I'm talking about your heart, your mind. The rest is just an overflow. Because when you have a heart that is generous and you have a mind that is generous, you just want to give. You just want to give. And you're able to cultivate that mindset that says, keep the change. Keep the change. Carlos, keep the change. God's blessed me so much. Let me be a blessing to you. Let me be a blessing to you. I'm going to challenge you today that this week, you ask God to put someone in your path that you could be a blessing to. Pastor Eric, but you don't know my financial. I don't know your financial situation. But I know this. The key to unlocking your financial freedom is called generosity. It's called generosity. You want to see something different? Then do something different. Stop listening to the TikTok influencers. Stop listening to the social media people. Follow these five steps. No, no, no. Go what the Bible says. Try the Bible for once. Forget about what your banker tells you. Forget about what your financial oh, guru tells you. I'm not saying that their wisdom and their advice is bad. But go with what God says. Try it. Try this week. So God, put someone in my path that I could be generous to, that I could give to. And guess what? Don't give to someone that could give you back. Give to someone that probably could never give you back. But that you could be that branch, that extension of God's grace and say, hey, I want to be a blessing to you. I just want to bless you. I promise you, you will, if you do that, next week you will come back with a testimony. Next week, we're going to be talking a little bit more about breaking the bondage of debt. Baking free from financial bondage. But for right now, let me just remind you, life's possessions, sorry, life does not consist of the possessions you have. But it consists of Him. Because Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So church, I close this message today with an invitation. The same invitation God does in His Word. Would you be willing to be generous? Would you be willing to start changing your mindset, your ways of being, instead of asking for you would you probably start praying for other people? Instead of just wanting more for you, would you trust God that what He gives you, you could be a blessing 
to other people. Because the moment that we change our mindset, the moment we change our heart, then the rest will just flow. I want Ignite Church to be a prosperous church. I always love saying it, and I'll say it again. Ignite Church, we are a debt-free church. And that's because of the generous people in this house. Everything we do, every event we do, every mission trip that we've done, we are debt-free. I know we don't have our own personal location yet, but it sets us up for success when we do. But it starts with you, that generous heart. So everybody's eyes closed and heads bowed. God, we thank you in this morning. I thank you for your word, Lord. I, I know that this is not probably a subject that many people shout amen and scream hallelujah. hallelujah and we see angels fall and people delivered and healed, God. But I do believe that it is a word that causes transformation in people's lives. And I pray, Lord, as you have invited us into a gratitude and having a heart of gratitude, help us, Lord, be gracious. Help us be grateful and not hold back. Because like the widow, Lord, she only had a little. Probably some of us might have a lot, but probably some of us might just have a little. Whether a little or a lot, Lord, help us learn to be good stewards of what you've given us, Lord. Help us be a blessing, God. Not considering our own needs always, Lord, but considering other needs over us, Father God. Thinking about other people and how you've called us to be a blessing, God. I pray that this week you will put someone in our hearts, in our lives, God, in our path, that we can be a blessing too. Lord, I believe that as the church of Jesus becomes more giving, Lord, the world would know <laughs> that Jesus, you are real. Because right now the world sees the church as a consumer versus a giver. And Lord, you've called us to give. You've called us to love. You've called us to reach out. And I pray that we will be that church that loves, that gives, and reaches out, God. I pray, Lord, as we take this journey, that you would give us wisdom, Lord, and that you would help us make steps, change our, our, our patterns in our lives, Lord, so we could be free from all financial burden, Father God, from all financial bondage, that we could walk in freedom, Father God. And that, Lord, as we give, Lord, we know that your word says, God, that you will give even more, God. And we trust in you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Give the Lord a mighty hand clap, praise church. I encourage you next week, we're really going to be talking a little bit deeper on how culture many times affects the way that we give. So I encourage you, invite someone. This is, is going to be an interesting series. We're going to be talking a little bit about things that are going to kind of like uh, hit our heart and kind of provoke us to make changes. Don't just be... Uh, touched by the message, start making the changes and you'll start seeing how God does things in your life that you've only dreamed of because that's the God we serve who could do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond whatever we ask, think, or imagine. Amen? God bless you guys. Remember socials this Wednesday, ladies. We'll see you next week.